Therefore, it's time for member statements. The member from Lambton Kent Middlesex. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This is Rail Safety Week, and every year this week serves as an important reminder for both pedestrians and motorists to be aware and vigilant around railway tracks and especially at crossings. Our railways are critical infrastructure and an important part of our history, but unfortunately, more than 100 deaths or serious injuries occur each year in Canada as a result of collisions or trespassing incidents. Whether you're on foot, in a car, or on a bike or snowmobile, a collision with a train will not end well, so education and mindfulness about rail safety are critical for everyone. Mr. Speaker, in my riding of Lambton Kent Middlesex, there are, I believe, more unprotected level crossings of the CN and CP main lines than anywhere else in Ontario. Unprotected crossings do not have barriers or lights and bells where rural roads meet railway lines, a situation that can be made even more dangerous at times when brush may be high, blocking sight lines. Tragically, Mr. Speaker, there have been a number of fatalities at these crossings in Lambton, Kent, Middlesex in recent years, which is why I also urge all levels of government to be aware of the danger of inadequate sight lines at crossings as they develop and maintain properties along rail lines. Trains today are quite quiet and are often moving much more quickly than they appear to be from a distance. Remember, always obey railway signs and signals and be vigilant at unprotected crossings and along tracks. Thank you. Good message. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, last week the Liberals announced a number of changes to rent control legislation in this province. Unfortunately, there was no mention of a very large loophole in the legislation, and that's called vacancy decontrol. In my writing, tenants report that they deal with landlords who cut services, consistently push for above guideline rent increases. Uh, who carry on incredibly disruptive construction as a way of demoralizing tenants, discouraging them, and getting them to move out. And unfortunately, those tactics are successful. They do happen. And people see units that friends and family lived in being rented out to a new person at 30 to 40 percent above what they were paying previously. This is a huge loophole. Speaker, a huge loophole, one which, if not closed, will result in more and more tenants being pushed out as landlords see the opportunity to cash in on the real estate bonanza that's going on in the GTA. Speaker, tenants worked very hard. They pushed very hard to get protection. They were able to push the Liberals to move some distance, but this loophole still has to be dealt with. This fight is not over. And tenants need the law changed so that their homes will be secure and so they won't be driven out just so that someone can make a killing. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Durham. Thank you, Speaker. Last Friday, I had the pleasure of visiting Grandview Children's Centre located in Oshawa. While I have visited there many times before, this visit was extra special because it, I had the opportunity to meet with five mothers whose children attended Grandview Children's Centre. Each parent had a different story to tell of how Grandview helps with their child's development and unique needs. Grandview Children's Centre is the only children's centre treatment centre in Durham Region that provides specialised programs, outpatient clinic, clinical treatment, and support to thousands of children and youth with special needs and their families. Mr. Speaker, two of Grandview's satellite locations are located in my riding of Durham, and I see firsthand the great work that is being done to support our children. In fact, Grandview Children's Centre has repeatedly stressed how they want to do more but can't due to space constraint. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased that the Minister of Children and Youth Services is committed to making Grandview's capital requests one of their top priorities. It is my hope that the five parents whom I met and the many other parents like them will soon see a larger Grandview for their deserving children. I'd like to thank the Grandview staff and the, Chil and the Children's Centre for all that they do in our community, as well as their families for their ongoing commitment and dedication to their children. 
Thank you. Thank you for the member of statements. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yes, uh, thank you, Speaker. Today, on behalf of uh, I rise on behalf of our leader, Patrick Brown, the Ontario PC Caucus, to speak to again recognize a very tragic day of remembrance for the Armenian community. April 24, 2017, is the 102nd anniversary of a horrifying eight-year period of systematic deportation and mass extermination of Armenians by the Turkish government at the time. Beginning with the arrest and murder of many prominent members of the Armenian community, and uh, this genocide saw 1.5 million Armenians die through state-sanctioned action that included forced conscriptions and deportation death marches towards the Syrian desert. Men, women, children, and elderly, none were spared by in what has been recognized as an attempt to exterminate Armenians in Turkey. To date, over 28 nations have publicly acknowledged the genocide. Even today, more and more evidence of this terrible crime is uncovered. Just last week, a Turkish historian working out of the USA deciphered Turkish government telegrams providing details on the deportation and murder of Armenians in eastern Turkey. Despite constant denials and refusals from some camps to characterize these actions as genocide, we will continue to recognize and remember these events for exactly what they were. I stand in solidarity with the Armenian community in commemoration today as we ensure these heinous acts are not forgotten and we continue to push all governments to acknowledge the genocide so that meaningful reconciliation can occur. I know yesterday, Speaker, the Armenian communities here in Toronto as well as Cambridge uh, held services, and I again, on behalf of our leader, Patrick Brown, and the Ontario PC Caucus, uh, want to recognize uh, what is now the 102nd anniversary of this hor horrific act. Thank you. Well done, Thank you. Further members, David, member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I have spoken a number of times in this chamber about the importance of healthy food. And last Friday, I had the great privilege to attend the grand opening of the Hamilton Community Food Centre on Hamilton Mountain. This is a project of our Neighbour to Neighbour Centre, partnering with Community Food Centres Canada. And I I have to tell you, this is a fantastic addition to our community. Neighbour to Neighbour plays a vital role serving my constituents. Over the years, they have expanded to provide a number of services that support those in need. Our community food centre is a welcoming and safe space, offering food-based programs that bring everyone together to grow, cook, share and advocate for good food. People can take advantage of the after-school program. They can drop in for the Global Roots lunch or a family dinner. They can get a fresh, affordable, and nutritious fruit and vegetables offered every week at the Global Food Market and Cafe. The centre also offers a language exchange program and an intercultural community kitchen, as well as support and training advocacy and community action. The Hamilton Community Food Centre has been two years in the making and it has received support from the Ontario Trillium Foundation and many other contributors. I'm delighted to see the results of that work, and it will be such an improvement and such a great hub on Hamilton Mountain that will play a huge part in our lives. I want to offer my congratulations and thanks to Neighbour Neighbours Executive Denise Arkell, her dedicated staff, and the hundreds of volunteers who do so much to make our community a better place. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I rise today to speak about the importance of financial literacy. Um, teaching financial literacy, Speaker, is so important because it allows people to make the most of their money. It allows them to do important things in life, like go to university or to college or to buy a home or to retire or support their families. And teaching financial literacy at a young age is that, is that much more important. And that is why I have been an advocate, along with many of my colleagues, to make sure that we do more to teach financial literacy to young people in Ontario. And that is why I'm so proud that our government is introducing uh, a financial literacy pilot programs in civics classes at 20 high schools across the province, a really important step in that regard. Recently, Speaker, I had the opportunity to participate in two great events that do just that, that teach young people about financial literacy, that welcome students from my riding in Etobicoke Centre, but also from across the GTA. For the second time now, I joined the Junior Economic Club of Canada for their day on Bay, where students had the chance to ask me anything about financial literacy. Like in November, when I took part in my first day on Bay, I was once again impressed by the curiosity and passion of young students to learn about how to manage their money. And I was also thrilled to speak at the Talk With Our Kids About Money event, hosted by the Canadian Foundation of Economic Education, 
two weeks ago. I was particularly proud of the first and second place winners as they were from Hilltop Middle School in my riding of Etobicoke Centre. At both these events, I saw students who were excited to learn about financial literacy, how to manage their money better, and seeing this reminded me of the importance of financial literacy and reminded me that our future is indeed bright. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from York Simcoe. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it is my pleasure to rise today to acknowledge an important milestone that has had a long-lasting impact on the protection and conservation of our important nat natural heritage and water resources in southern Ontario. This weekend was the 15th anniversary of the Oak Ridges Moraine Conservation Plan. I am pleased, as a long-standing member of this House, to have been here on December 13, 2001, when the Oak Ridges Moraine Conservation Act received third reading by an all-party unanimous vote. The Oak Ridges Moraine, alongside the Niagara Escarpment, is one of the most significant landform features in southern Ontario. As the headwaters to over 65 river and stream systems and the drinking water supply for over 250,000 people, our government acknowledged that it was time to bring people together to come up with a long-term solution to protect the moraine and its important natural heritage and vital water resources. In 2000, our progressive conservative government of the day announced a $15 million fund be established, which led to the creation of the Oak Ridges Moraine Foundation. The foundation has provided essential support to many, many groups. I had the opportunity to introduce visitors today, but we have many more who were unable to join us. So on behalf of the countless numbers of community groups and individuals, I'd like to say thank you. And to my colleagues in this House, I urge you to continue to build on the legacy laid down by our government 15 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Member Stevens, the member from Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in solidarity with the Armenian community here in Ontario and across Canada to recognize the 102nd anniversary of, of the Armenian Genocide. This occasion is an opportunity for us to come together in reflection and strengthen our resolve to reject intolerance and hatred in all of its forms. On this very day, 102 years ago, troops from the Ottoman Empire were dispatched to massacre and remove Armenians from their homes. These innocent people were violently displaced from their communities, and many were subject to torture, abuse, and to starvation. In all, it is estimated 1.5 million Armenians were massacred during the genocide. Despite this great tragedy, Mr. Speaker, the Armenian people remain resilient and many manage to escape this attack against their communities to find homes across the world. In my own riding of Scarborough Asian Corps, we witnessed this, the strength and determination of the Armenian uh, Canadian community here in Ontario. Just yesterday, Minister Koto and I attended an annual Armenian Genocide commemorative event hosted by the Armenian National Committee of Toronto. This event not only allows us to bear witness to the tragedy that struck the Armenian people between 1915 and 1923, it also enables us to reflect, to remember, and to celebrate the contributions of Armenian Canadians to Ontario. The Armenian Community Centre, where the commemorative events were held, was being seen as a hub for Toronto's thriving Armenian community since it was established in 1960s. The people of Scarborough Asian Court, Mr. Speaker, actually received many, many support from this exceptional hub. Speaker, on behalf of the legislature, I'd like to thank the Armenian community for reminding us of the significance of the recognizing this past tragedies. As we celebrate Ontario 150, we must keep in mind the importance of education on atrocities such as the Armenian genocide so that we may work towards shaping a more peaceful Thank future you. and remain steadfast in creating a more just world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Haldeman, Norfolk. Yes, last year Ontario became the uh, first province in Canada to uh, rack up over $300 billion in debt. Worse yet, there are plans to add more debt in the future with no plans to uh, cut taxes. To paraphrase a, a famous quote from Ben Franklin, in today's Ontario, nothing can be certain except death, debt, and taxes. 
This government is mortgaging the future of a generation that really doesn't have a running start due to physical mismanagement. It's not only our children, our grandchildren, future generations who will be burdened with paying off government debt through ever-increasing taxes. And last week's housing tax is no surprise as the, uh, the government solution to any problem seems to consist of taxes, taxes, taxes and more taxes. This housing tax will do nothing to address housing supply and the shortage of residential land. So I, I do question uh, how many new taxes, like uh, this housing tax, have we seen over the past 13 years of uh, present uh, government rule, and how many tax hikes have we seen under both Kathleen and Dalton, the debt doublers. I thank all members for their, um, their statements. Uh, pursuant to the order of the House earlier today, under a unanimous consent, I will now recognize three members, one from each party, to speak for up to five minutes to recognize, recognize Jean Vachem. I would now turn to the member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to first state that um, we remember here on this side of the House Ted Chudley. He was the member, uh, the former member for Halton Hills, and he uh, passed the um, it was Bill 66 in 1998, an act to pro proclaim Holocaust Memorial Day Yom Hashoah in Ontario. So we want to thank him for his great work. Um, it's an honour and a privilege to rise each year and to speak before our distinguished guests. We have Barit Kalam the, from the Israeli Consulate here in Toronto, as well as uh, many of the um, board members uh, from Yad Vashem uh, Society and uh, Holocaust survivors, their family, their friends, and good friends of my family, Jocelyn and Jerry Cooper from my riding of Thornhill. Uh, There's a movie out in the theaters now called The Zookeeper's Wife, and it's based on a non-fiction book built, uh, written by a poet and a naturalist, Diane Ackerman. And she's drawing on the unpublished diary of Antonina Zabinska, and it recounts a true story of how she and her husband, Jan Zabinski, director of the Warsaw Zoo, saved the lives of 300 Jews who had been imprisoned in the Warsaw Ghetto following the German invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939. And basically what happens is, is that the zoo had been bombed and damaged and many of the animals were killed. But the, this family with their son were um, obviously not Jewish, but they were fighting with the resistance against the Nazi, Nazi occupation of uh, Poland. And what they began to do is, covertly, they began working with the resistance and bringing Jews who were trying to hide from the Nazis, um, often temporarily, into the zoo. And uh, I haven't seen the movie yet, but I wanted to speak about it today because I want to encourage people to understand that there were many, what Yad Vashem terms, righteous among the nations who helped Jews escape, who saved Jewish lives, and we always remember them on this day while we mourn those who uh, were, were slaughtered. Um, I think it's uh, an interesting story for a lot of reasons because they had sympathy for animals, and I like to feel that that translates into their sympathy for human beings, and they even uh, gave names of animals to the uh, Jewish families that they were hiding. One family was called the squirrels and things like that. And they couldn't keep it up for very long, Mr. Speaker, for the simple reason that they had staff that came during the day that were suspicious about why so much food was being consumed. So you could see all the challenges that they faced. Their own lives were in danger, and in fact, they were um, punished for what they had done. The um, w story revolves around the fact that she was a very you know, established piano player, and there was a certain song that all the Jews knew meant go into hiding if she played that song. And she played a different song when it was safe to come out. So we see the resistance that people have. 
the strong, um, how strong we can be in the face of adversity. And I think that that is the message from the Holocaust. We've also heard many statements today about the Armenian Genocide. And there are many in the Jewish community who feel that the Armenian Genocide encouraged the Nazis to um, have their own genocide against the Jews. They felt, wow, the world didn't care. So they felt very comfortable with what they were doing. Um, and just yesterday, there was, um, I believe the, one of the members mentioned, there was an article in the Toronto Star about a professor who's finding true, uh, more data on the Armenian Genocide. And we keep uncovering, unfortunately, more data on the Holocaust as well. Um, I just want to say that Yad Vashem is, uh, you know, an organization as well as the memorial in Israel and with their beautiful garden, a testament to the righteous among the nations. And it's a museum that's, you really have to spend a whole day there and even then you haven't touched on all the displays and everything there is to learn and to witness. It's difficult, but it's important that we not just remember the horrific things that were done to those in the Jewish community, but that we ensure that we try our best to ensure that this doesn't keep continuing. And unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, we see what's going on in Syria. We saw what went on in Rwanda. And it's very heartbreaking for people who went through the Holocaust to wake up in the morning and see that the world isn't perfect still. After everything that they suffered, I think they really thought, well, at least now the world will understand anti-Semitism and understand genocide. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further responses, the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome to distinguished guests, members of the Yad Vashem Society, and to uh, Consul General. Welcome to Queen's Park. I usually say when I stand up that it's a privilege to rise in the House, but today I'm going to say something different. It's a duty to rise in the House. It's a duty because I'm not Jewish, I'm Gentile. It's a duty because I'm a Christian minister. It's a duty because I'm an elected member of a Canadian government, and it's a duty to say, among other things, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, my sin, my most grievous sin, to quote a Christian Latin phrase, because there's lots to be sorry for. Um, first of all, the hard history in Canada. Right now, there are eight times more hate crimes against Jews than any other group. That's right now, according to Stats Canada. Uh, my father regaled me with stories uh, about anti-Semitism as I was growing up, and one of them was during his lifetime, which was uh, on the beach, in the beach, uh, on the boardwalk, a uh, sign that said, no Jews, no dogs. In my own riding of Sunnyside, just by the lake, uh, there's Sunnyside Pool, which everyone knows in my community, uh, had signs up where Jews were only allowed to swim at certain hours during the day. We've had prime ministers, we've had premiers, we've had elected members from all parties who've uttered anti-Semitic uh, remarks in the House over the history of our country. This was not a fringe aspect of Canadian society. This has been a part of Canadian society, and it's one we have to acknowledge. Um, and certainly we see it now. We see it in this last year with bomb threats at the JCC, not too far from here, with swastikas painted on people's doors, uh, and certainly with a barrage of online hatred. Uh, as a Christian minister, of course, I have a lot to apologize for, too. Uh, certainly in the history of the church during Nazi times, very, very few Christians actually stood up to Hitler. Most churches had swastika flags and had Nazis worshipping in their communities. Um, there was a small minority of Christians who stood up, who were the righteous among nations. Uh, people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was executed, the confessing church, very small minority, and he said something very profound. He said, the most important thing a Christian can say in these days, this was back in the 40s, in these days is that Jesus was a Jew. And for that, he was killed himself. Um, a particular story that I've used in my preaching many times about a small town in the former Soviet Union where 90 children were pulled up in a, a warehouse um, where all their parents had been killed and the soldiers, the Nazis who were uh, on duty complained about the crying of the children, that it was bad for their morale, that it kept them awake at night. And the chaplains said something. Yes, they did. They objected. They didn't object to their parents being killed, but they objected to that. And then when that objection was overruled, they just went on with their jobs. Again, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. 
Um, I have had the privilege, and it is a privilege, to go to Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, to walk through all the rooms there, and there are many, the Hall of Names, the Hall of Remembrance, the Garden of the Righteous Among the Nations, all of them profound, all of them moving, but the most moving is the Children's Memorial. And when you stand in that room with five candles lit, magnified by a number of mirrors around that house, and you hear the names of 1.5 million children who were murdered during the Holocaust continuous, continuously, uh, it gives you just the beginning of a sense of the horror that was the Holocaust and that we remember today. Um, certainly, I think that that is something everyone should do, and I would invite everyone to do that, go to Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. But you know, it's not enough to apologize. It's really something we have to continue to make sure never happens again, as my friend from Thornhill says. Um, and that is to put real life to those words never again, to put real meaning behind them, to make sure that in this day, at this time, wherever we are in all of our writings, that we are a testament to what happened, to those who lost their lives, and a commitment to breathe life into the words never again, and to put everything we have into that sentiment. In honor of those 1.5 million children to the six million Jews, um, to the horror that was and that has been part of our own history that we need to acknowledge. I say again, never again. Thank you. Thank you. Further statements? The member from the Minister of Children and Youth Services and the Minister responsible for anti uh, for Anti-racism. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and it is an honor to join uh, my friend from Thornhill and uh, Parkdale High Park as we uh, welcome our distinguished guest and the Consul General here to the Legislature. It's an honor for me to uh, to rise in the House today to uh, recognize Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, for 70 years, uh, Mr. Speaker, this day um, has been held in the memory of over six million. Jewish people who were killed during the Holocaust. There are no words, Mr. Speaker, that I or any person can say to do justice to describe the atrocities of the Holocaust and adequately honour all of its victims. But it is important that we try. It is important that we reflect to remember on what happened and how it happened and understand its devastating effects. In 1933, before the start of World War II, there were over 9 million Jewish people in Europe. Only 12 years later, almost two-thirds of all Jewish people in Europe had been killed. Even in Canada, Jewish people were barred from entry into the country in 1939 when they were desperate to escape Nazi Germany during World War II. This is not a history, as Canadians, that we are proud of. Anti-Semitism also meant that Jewish people were routinely denied access to jobs and the public, public services. Though it has been 70 years since the tragedy of the Holocaust, anti-Semitism has persisted throughout history and continues today. The Ontario Human Rights Commission Creed Policy says that anti-Semitism can take many forms, ranging from individual acts of discrimination, physical violence, vandalism and hatred, to more organized and systemic efforts to destroy an entire community and genocide. The Toronto Police Service's most recent hate crime report found that 30 per cent of all hate crime in Toronto in 2016 was against our very own Jewish community here in the city. This is 2017, and this is Ontario. History shows us that the Holocaust started with hateful words and acts. It was nurtured by intolerance and, and exclusion, and by the willingness of ordinary people to go along with the systemic erosion of Jewish social and political rights, which led to genocide. When we stand still and turn a blind eye, we are complicit. We risk repeating history when we ignore the hatred and the discrimination that's around us today. We as a government stand united in the elimination of racism 
and anti-Semitism here in Ontario. There are no excuses. Anti-Semitism is unacceptable. Racism, bigotry and hate crime are unacceptable. So are the systemic barriers and unconscious biases that can perpetuate anti-Semitism and disproportionate outcomes for racialized people in our institutions. So we as a government are taking action. Last month, the Anti-Racism Directorate released a Better Way Forward, Ontario's three-year anti-racism strategic plan, which sets out a roadmap on how people in the province will combat systemic racism and build a culture of social inclusion and racial equity here in our society. Mr. Speaker, together, government is working towards eliminating systemic racism. Our three-year plan includes public aware awareness and education and initiatives to make people aware of any form of racism, that any form of racism is unacceptable. We have a responsibility as Ontarians to stand up and to be bold in the face of racism. Today, we remember those who were tragically killed in the Holocaust, and we stand together with the, with the Jewish community against anti-Semitism here in our province, across Canada, and around the world. We cannot be silent to any form of racism or racial discrimination. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank all members uh, for their statements, and by the same unanimous consent, I now turn to the member from Thornhill to recite the ancient Hebrew prayer. I would ask that all that can please stand and show our respect. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Normal, normally, the uh, mourner's uh, Kaddish, uh, as it's called, uh, is recited for a close relative. Um, people come to visit mourners for the week after they've passed away. We call it Shiva. Shiva's from the Hebrew word seven. And uh, for 11 months after a close relative, such as a parent, passes away, we recite it, and then we recite it on specific days, on specific holidays, in synagogues or wherever we may be. Today, we're standing to recite the Kaddish in memory of uh, six million who perished in the Holocaust who don't have anybody to recite it for them because, Mr. Speaker, not just families were wiped out, entire villages were gone. So please join me if you, um, we're gonna break protocol because normally people can't talk in the galleries. Is it okay with you, Mr. Speaker, if people recite in the galleries? Thank you very much. Yid Gadol v'yid Gadash Me Rabah. Belma di fra crote Viamlich Malhute Bechayehon Ube Biomehon Uve Chaye Dachal Beit Israel Bagala Bisman Karif Vimru Ame Yehesh me Rabat Uvarach Lalam Ulema Me Alamea Yit Barach Yit Gat Yishtabach, Vit Paar, Vit Raman, Vit Nase, Vit Hadar, Vit Ale, Vit Halal, Shme Kudsha, Brihu, Leile Min Kol, Vir Kata, Vir Shirata, Tush Bechata, Vinechamata, Dame Ran, Balma, Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shlama Rabba, Mi Shamaya, Vahayen Aleinu Velko Israel Vimru Amen. Ose Shalom Bim Romav Huya Se Shalom Aleinu Velko Israel Vimru Amen. It is therefore now time for reports by committees. Report